Hello, and welcome to show number 2313 of Eyes on Success, a weekly program covering a wide variety of topics of interest to people with vision loss. I'm Nancy Goodman Torpy. And I'm Pete Torpy. For many years, we've had a developing countries program, and we've delivered very successful training to uh, nonprofit organizations in countries across Africa. Southeast Asia, and in Latin America. As a result of that, uh, these organizations are now creating accessible books using international standards, the standards that we promote and develop at the DAISY Consortium. So that's just fantastic. And today we'll be talking about an organization that has not only had a huge impact about how people read around the world, but is increasing their impact by the work they're currently doing. The DAISY Consortium is an international organization that aims to improve access to information for people with print disabilities around the world. We'll speak with George Kirscher and Richard Orm, who you just heard, about their impact on EPUB standards and their latest work to reach even more people in underdeveloped countries. But first for our tip of the week. This week's tip comes from George Kirscher. My tip is. I love reading on Windows, and I'm reading complicated books and not just novels. And I recommend software called Thorium, T-H-O-R-I-U-M. It's available on Windows, Mac, and Linux. For Windows, you just go to the Microsoft Store and, and download the Thorium. It's freely available. It is just a terrific tool for reading books. It's an EPUB reader. And if you're hooked on to Bookshare, you can search for titles there and download in the EPUB format. And it's just a great reading experience. Support for Eyes on Success is provided by Insight.org, N-S-I-T-E dot O-R-G, and Insight Connect, a job board exclusively designed for individuals who experience vision loss and employers who seek to fill open positions with talent who are blind or have low vision. Job postings are also open to veterans. Insight, a vision for talent. You are listening to Eyes on Success. Success, 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 success. Let's start by meeting George and Richard. Well, we have two guests with us today, one of whom has been with us before. And maybe we can start with you, George. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do? Oh, it's great to be here, Pete. Uh, my name is George Kirscher, uh, Chief Innovation Officer with the DAISY Consortium. And I also am Senior Officer of Global Literacy with Benetech and Bookshare. I live in Missoula, Montana. And you've been with the DAISY Consortium for some time now. Uh, since 96, so since its inception. And you're a user of DAISY format material. Oh, yeah. I'm blind. Um, started in on the digital texts uh, back in 1988 and uh, been working in the publishing domain ever since, trying to develop the best way to read for people with uh, all kinds of print disabilities. And our second guest is new to Eyes on Success. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, Richard? Hi, Pete. Yeah, my name is Richard Orm. I live right in the middle of England. Uh, I've been with DAISY since 2015. I myself am not uh, print disabled or visually impaired, but my grandmother was a user of DAISY materials. And of course, not only people with sight loss use accessible formats, my son who has dyslexia, he also uses accessible formats. George, the last time you were on the show, you said something that was really memorable, that you had gotten a special award from the airline that flies in and out of Missoula, Montana, for a, a bazillion air miles with a guide dog. How many are you up to now? I am approaching 4 million air miles. Uh, if you look at all the different 
airlines that I fly with. Uh, I've got almost two and a half million with Delta alone. And it was Delta that <laughs> went to CSUN and gave my, my first guide dog, Nesbitt, uh, his own frequent flyer card. <laughs> Aww. And do you remember the comment you made to which Nancy is referring? No. Oh, this was a great comment. I'm still quoting it to people. You said they have all different levels of frequent flyer status. There's silver, there's gold, there's platinum, and there's divorced. <laughs> and the trick was to stop before you get to divorced. Yes, that is a uh, very humorous. That's, that's <laughs> very and which number guide dog are you up to now? I'm on my third guide dog. I'm I'm still on my first wife, <laughs> and uh, we're celebrating our 50th anniversary this year. Wow. Makes us feel like newbies at 40. <laughs> Support for Eyes on Success is made possible in part by our corporate partners. Find out more about partnership opportunities by sending an email to hosts at eyesonsuccess.net. This week's focus topic is novel innovations from the DAISY Consortium. And in case any of you don't know what DAISY stands for, it is an acronym for Digital Accessible Information System, which is a technical standard for digital audiobooks, periodicals, and computerized text. Well, today we wanted to talk about DAISY in general and sort of what's new in DAISY, but just for people who aren't familiar with it all, Daisy's been around for a long time, and developing this for visually impaired people turned out to be a good thing for sighted individuals, too. So tell us a little bit about Daisy and its impact. Well, uh, Daisy Consortium is the nonprofit global authority on publishing and reading for people with blindness, with low vision, and other print disabilities. And our members around the world have decades of experience producing accessible publications for people with print disabilities. We also have a team of international experts, and that team develops standards, tools, and best practices, which are, have been embraced by the leading technology companies like Microsoft, Apple, Google, by publishers, and of course, by library services. And using the technologies that have been developed by DAISY, our members have produced millions of books, journals, newspapers, and documents that can be read by people with disabilities in the ways that work for them, whether someone needs to read through enlarged text, through audio or Braille, on whatever continent and in whatever language there are technologies and standards developed by the DAISY Consortium that are making information accessible to everyone. When you say these standards have been embraced by mainstream media, many of these innovations that were developed for DAISY have been incorporated into EPUB, which is the standard reading for people without difficulties. Right. So when the development of digital publishing uh, started in uh, uh, 1999, we jumped into the fray and uh, contributed our expertise. And we knew more about digital publishing at that time than, than anybody else. And we were able to guide the industry to develop a specification that would work for everybody that had rich navigation and features that would be needed by everybody. And it was just great to see the publishing industry embrace accessibility. And today we have publishers that are just doing a wonderful job creating uh, accessible materials. It's made a huge change in higher education where we see the deepest penetration of EPUB publications. And it's a great example of how making life a little better for special needs people actually improved life for everyone. Absolutely correct. So DAISY's come a long way since its inception, and the standards have changed, have been modified. You're incorporating a lot more flexibility in it now. Tell us what's new and some of the latest features that have been included into DAISY. The DAISY standard was developed at first to replace the analog cassette. 
And we did a really great job of building an audio system to convert those audiobooks and also build in navigation, go to page and, and things like that. And the DAISY standard has been around uh, for quite a while. It's used by NLS uh, and other organizations around the world. Bookshare also uses that format, but the DAISY standard hasn't changed in quite a while. And most of our efforts have been going toward improving the mainstream formats and standards and making sure that they're going to work effectively for everybody. So that's been the thrust of our technical developments and work in the standards arena. The EPUB 3.3 standard is near completion within the W3C now. I'm confident it'll come out this year, and it's going to be backward compatible with earlier versions of uh, EPUB 3. Can you give us an example of what types of modifications you're talking about specifically? Well, for example, one of the things that we've built into the specification recently is accessibility metadata. And the publisher can now identify that it's uh, conforming to WCAG 2.0 or 2.1 and uses the EPUB accessibility features such as page numbers and has rich navigation. And the publishers can include this metadata in the EPUB file and also report on the accessibility features through Onyx feeds that are ways for distributing accessible uh, metadata about the books they're selling. And now retailers, Vital Source and Red Shelf right now, are exposing that accessibility metadata right on their website, and you can see how accessible it is and what are the accessibility features that have been put in by the publisher. That means people can know before they buy what they're getting into. That's a big improvement. What are some of the current initiatives at the DAISY Consortium? Now, in addition to evolving the standards and tools on accessible publishing, what we're also keen to do at DAISY is to make sure that blind people everywhere have access to books for leisure, for education, and for employment. And most of the world's blind people actually live in the lower resource countries of the world, developing countries, least developed countries, and so on. And in places like this, often they don't have access to daisy players, maybe not to smartphones and computers. They may not have internet access and computers. So that's a real challenge that we need to grapple with. How can people lift themselves up, people with disabilities who are especially disadvantaged, and through education, uh, lift themselves out of poverty and play a part in their countries? And I understand the DAISY Consortium has been working hard on mitigating those problems. Can you talk about that? Sure. For many years, we've had a developing countries program, and we've delivered very successful training to uh, nonprofit organizations in countries across Africa, Southeast Asia, and in Latin America. As a result of that, uh, these organizations are now creating accessible books using international standards, the standards that we promote and develop at the DAISY Consortium. So that's just fantastic. But still, we hit the issue that people don't have access to the devices that we're fortunate enough to have in the richer countries, like the smartphones and the DAISY players. And recognizing that this is an issue, we work together with Microsoft, who are supporting us through a grant that we won through a competitive process to develop new software that we'll be releasing soon that enables us to unlock the treasure trove of accessible books that have been produced and to be able to convert them so that they will play on the kinds of devices that people are more likely to have their hands on. So that could be basic MP3 players or it could be some wonderful devices which are solar powered, really cheap, usable by someone who doesn't have sight. The buttons can be felt and it can be controlled by that. 
and give someone a daisy-like experience of navigable audio. And by that, I mean, if a child has their textbooks for the year loaded onto one of these solar-powered devices, which just fits in the palm of the hand, they're able to navigate to the right subject, to the right book, to the unit, to the lesson, and then to be able to have access for the first time to the textbooks in a format that they can actually read. That's great because education is so valuable in terms of lifting oneself up out of poverty. We have a colleague, Dipendra Manocha, who lives in India. Uh, and recently he went on a visit to one of the more rural areas in India. And in many developing countries, there may be infrastructure in the capital city and in larger urban centers. But in the rural parts of these countries, they may not have internet access. That's very common. And it's also common that they don't have access to stable electricity and power. And Dipendra tells us um, a very moving story about visiting a school where he was talking with blind children of the age 12 or 13, and none of them had ever read a book. None of them had ever had access to textbooks. None of them could spell their own name, so disconnected they were from reading and writing. And imagine the difference that can be made now, because organizations are creating these accessible textbooks. We've trained them to produce them to these international standards. And now for the first time, thanks to this Microsoft grant, they'll be able to use this easy to use software. Uh, the teachers will be able to convert the books that do exist that have been made in proper standard uh, versions like EPUB and DAISY, but they'll be able to convert them so they can be used on the lower power devices that people actually have and they can study and learn along with their sighted peers. Are you developing or helping people develop special hardware to do this? We're making use of, of uh, devices that exist in these countries. We're not developing new solutions. We're repurposing them. So we're repurposing existing what are called feature phones. Would you believe if you go to many parts of Africa, what you'll see are those Nokia phones, the kind of what we call candy bar um, phones. Uh, and people use these. They've got physical buttons, if you remember them, but they can play MP3 files too. So taking a, a Daisy book or an EPUB book and putting it so that actually that will work on a Nokia phone that's repurposing the technology that otherwise is used simply for um, making phone calls. And the same is true of the solar powered devices that I mentioned. They were originally designed, actually, not for blind people, but to be talking Bibles for people who cannot read uh, because they don't have the reading skills. But by using those devices, which are very cheap and suitable for the environments we're talking about, which are dusty and hot, they're proven in those, um, in those environments. But by making use of the innovative folder structure, which isn't kind of a to a regular standard or anything, we've been able to convert the books that are accessible and have got the kind of navigation that I mentioned of between different subjects, chapters, lessons, and so on. And we then create the MP3 files according to the folder structure to give that navigation experience. Oh, so this way the phone doesn't have to have special software to do the navigation. You've just split the files up in a particular way so that they can just move to another MP3 file and get to whatever they're looking for directly. That's right. And it means that the book can still be created to the international standard. And that same book could be used on a Braille display. It could be used with a smartphone and a computer, but it can also be converted on to be used in these simple devices that people have in their hands. So when we're trying to get away from making special versions for individual users with different needs and different devices from the one master copy, you can produce something that works for any individual, whether they're reading through their eyes with larger print on a tablet. These sometimes uh, schools are um, given tablets by their um, governments. And so a student with low vision would be able to read a book because it has the text in it and the images. A student who wants to read through audio has the synthetic speech uh, to be able to navigate through. And a student who wants to read with a low cost or lower cost Braille display, such as an Orbit reader, 
they can do it too. So we call this reading through eyes, ears, and fingers, all from the same book that's being created just the once. Oh, nice. So you've addressed the hardware issues and the software issues, and I wanted to talk a little about the distribution issues. So as you pointed out, a lot of this material is already in some kind of standard format, but presumably more aimed at these higher level DAISY devices. How does the transformation happen to get it into the hands of these other devices? Well, one of the things we wanted to address is how organizations could use the technology developed by DAISY. The DAISY organizations around the world have been using the uh, tools that we've developed to produce the books for a long, long time. But it's usually required an, an IT department and powerful computers to use these things. And with this Microsoft grant, it's enabled us to build software that has a simple user interface that allows an organization with low resources and no IT staff to use this software to convert content to the format that's needed by the people they're serving. So it's very powerful and it can also use text-to-speech to generate MP3 files that could be put onto these uh, low-cost MP3 type players, the solar-powered players, and also converting to Braille files that uh, devices can use. Um, so it really is a range of formats that can be created from single sources, from your richest source and move it down to what the person in the developing country needs. And this is software that the DAISY Consortium presumably put together and offers to organizations, schools, teachers, et cetera? Going to be available globally to anybody who, who wants it. And while the focus has been on developing countries, I envision this being a great tool that could be used anywhere. Uh, I could see universities using it to convert content to formats that their students want. Uh, so it can be used in a range of environments. When do you expect it to be available? The software will be released at the end of March and it'll be on the DAISY website. It'll be free to download, uh, simple to install and use. Well, that is very exciting. As George mentioned, this software is based on well-advanced technology that's been developed by DAISY and used in advanced libraries for many years. So as well as being able to convert to devices that are simpler, it also allows the conversion between different formats. So we could see a university, for example, that has an EPUB file, may want to convert that to DAISY. Uh, there may be a DAISY text file that they want to convert to Braille. There's lots and lots of different conversions available within the family of scripts um, that sit within the pipeline technology. Uh, so this is useful for the least developed countries, but also for the most advanced countries too. Well, that really sounds like a tremendous tool. And the work you guys have been doing over the decades has really been important, both for accessibility for visually impaired people around the world. And as we talked about, even for the wider sighted community. So keep up the good work. These tools must be having quite an impact on the availability of accessible reading materials. DAISY members, the member organizations that make up the DAISY consortium, have of course been running libraries within their own countries and building up huge collections of accessible books in languages that are spoken around the world. This morning I was chatting with friends in Ouagadougou, which is in Burkina Faso in East Africa, where they speak French. And this is one of the least resourced countries in the world. They have no real accessible libraries for people with blindness and other print disabilities. But because of the Marrakesh Treaty, this allows the international exchange of books that have been created for blind people using what are called copyright exceptions. And so we could see, for example, our partner organization in Burkina Faso downloading some of the tens of thousands of books that have already been made in French, 
using our tool to convert them for the devices that people have in Burkina Faso. And that's a very, very quick win. And they'll be able to get books into the hands of people with blindness very quickly, rather than building up their own library piece by piece. Although, of course, they'll be creating local content uh, themselves using the tools we've developed as well. This tool will be able to take content from, for example, Once, which has a rich collection of content in Spanish in Spain, and be able to use that, convert it to uh, what is used in South America. The many Spanish-speaking countries there, I think, will be very happy to be able to get that kind of content and convert it and make it available locally in their country. They cannot do it right now. It's uh, dependent upon the release of this software. Well, that has to feel very rewarding to have such a worldwide impact. Congratulations, guys. You are listening to Eyes on Success. Success, 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 success. Now for this week's final item, how to learn more about the DAISY format standards and the work of the DAISY Consortium and how to contact them. If people are interested in finding out more about these tools and about the DAISY Consortium, where would you direct them? We have our website at daisy.org. And to find out information about this specific uh, converter project developed together with Microsoft, this is at daisy.org forward slash converter. And anybody can download that once it's available. Absolutely. Do you have a social media presence as well? We do. We're on Twitter at Accessible Daisy. And if people had questions for either of you, would they be able to contact you guys directly? We have a contact us form on our website. We'd love to hear from you. And in case you missed any of that in the audio, we'll have all of that contact information as well as more information about the Thorium EPUB reader in the show notes associated with this episode, which is episode 2313 at www.eyesonsuccess.net. That's it for today's show. Next week on Eyes on Success, we'll be talking about a pair of guide dog memoirs. Yes, you heard that correctly. Mark Carlson, who is a prolific author, has written, among other things, two memoirs that he claims to have co-authored with his guide dogs. We'll speak with Mark about his life and the books he's written and his experiences with his guide dogs and the ensuing memoirs, as well as his other passion, military strategy. And Mark is quite humorous and engaging, so we hope you'll catch us next week for that episode. You've been listening to Eyes on Success, hosted and produced by Nancy Goodman Torpy and Peter Torpy. You can access the full archive of previous shows, subscribe to the podcast, and much more by going to our website, www.eyesonsuccess.net. If you have questions about anything you've heard on the show or have suggestions for future shows, send an email to hosts at eyesonsuccess.net. Thank you for listening and have a nice day.